Greetings all, Brian S. Pratt here again. <coughs> so, I'm going to be uh, reading chapter 3 of the Morsai Saga today. For a recap, um, James has James went for a job interview, passed through a door, now he's in the other world, he's in a forest, he doesn't know wh where he is, he's supposed to get to the village of Trendle, he is supposed to survive somehow, he has no idea how to do that. He, start, he's, he has started to um, do magic. He successfully levitated a stick, um, sh created a sharp spear, and then his orb, his ever-present orb that he uses throughout everything. He, he, he has that for the first time. And then he also did the um, slug thing, where you know he, he throws it and, and he fought off the wolves. And then at the end, end of chapter two, the wolves were almost ready to kill him. This guy shows up with a bow and rescues him. And now, chapter three with commentary. If there's anything to comment about. Okay. Disoriented upon awakening, his first thought was that he was lying abed back in his room after coming out of a particularly vivid dream. Unfortunately, real reality set in and memory returned. And so too did the pain. It wasn't a dream. The room bore little resemblance to the one where he had spent the majority of his time the last few years. The walls were fashioned of lengths of timber set horizontally like in a log cabin. There was very little in the way of furnishings. Merely the bed, a nightstand, and a chest with clothes folded neatly across the top. His spear back and backpack rested in the corner next to the chest with his clothes. Clothes? Lifting the covers, he discovered that he was naked as the day he was born. The only exception was a bandage that covered the wound on his leg where the wolf had bitten him. Not sure how he came to be in this place, he did vaguely remember someone at the edge of the stream who helped him fight off the wolves. Daylight filtered through a small window in the, fall, in the far wall. The soft pink tinge in the sky beyond indicated that sundown must be approaching. Or could it be dawn? Beyond the window came the sound of wood being split with an axe. A slightly off-key whistle tune accompanied the chopping. Lying quietly, he listened to the whack, whack, whack for a short time before the chopping stopped. Footsteps were then heard making their way around the cabin. From the other side of his bedroom door came the squeal of hinges in need of oiling, followed by the thud of, a, of wood being dumped into what James envisioned was a wood box. After an anxious moment of silence during which he strained to hear what was going on, nervousness filled him when footsteps started coming toward the door to his room. He listened with growing trepidation as they drew closer. Will he be friend or foe? Praying for the one praying for the one who approached to be counted among the former, but fearing he may be of the latter, James glanced toward the spear leaning against the wall. For a split second he contemplated going for it. But then the footsteps stopped just outside the door. The opportunity had passed. He watched with apprehension the turning of the door handle. In walked the man who had been at the river. Seeing James awake, he paused just within the door and gave him a disarming smile. Finally awake, I see. You slept all night and through most of this day. I bet you're hungry, yes? He was in his mid-forties, about six feet tall with brown hair and quite muscular. Nothing fat about him. He was in good shape. Dressed in woodsman attire, he had a clean, if not stylish, appearance. Earlier apprehension was soon alleviated by the man's friendly, friendly demeanor. James gave him a nod. A loud rumbling from his belly answered the question. After a moment of silence, he asked, Where am I? And who do I have to thank for my life? As to where you are, you are here in my cabin. My name is Saren, and I am the forest warden in these parts. It was lucky I came along when you did. That wolf pack would have had you for dinner for sure. Saren, James said, hoping to have pronounced the name correctly. My name's James. I appreciate you saving me. Saren's grin widened. Glad I was there to help. You can rest for a little while longer. Supper's cooking and will be a few more minutes before it is ready. He gestured toward the clothes upon the chest. I cleaned them a bit, washed out the worst of it. If you have the strength in which to get dressed, you can join me in the other room. If not, I'll bring a bowl in here. You wait for James's reaction. When nothing was forthcoming, he mumbled, strangest clothes I've ever seen, then turned and without another word closed the door as he left the room. Soon the sound of what James's grandfather called puttering could be heard coming from the outer room. 
not really having the energy to leave the comfort of the bed, but not wanting to eat dinner naked beneath the covers either, James gingerly sat and swung his legs over the edge. The movement caused the throbbing in his leg to increase. He remained sitting for a few moments to gather his courage before braving the pain and stand. It's not going to hurt that bad. Coming to his feet proved how wrong he was. The pain was the worst he'd ever felt in his life. It took every ounce of fortitude and willpower he possessed to cross the ten feet to where his clothes lay. As soon as he came within reach of the spear, he took it and used it for support. Doing so did much to relieve his discomfort. He found that his clothes had indeed been cleaned. He proceeded to dress himself in his, as Saren put it, strange clothes. Once clothed, he brought his backpack to the bed and sat. He took inventory of what remained of his meager possessions. Everything was there except the book explaining the workings of magic. He did a visual search of the area where his backpack had been, but failed to find it. It occurred to him that he could possibly have lost it during his flight from and subsequent fight with the wolves, but that didn't seem likely. The backpack had been closed tightly throughout the ordeal and remained closed now. Could Saren have taken it? James didn't want to believe that of his benefactor, but what did he really know of the man? Deciding to take things one step at a time, he returned his pack to the corner. He hobbled across the room with the aid of a spear, opened the door, and peered through to the outer room. Beyond, he found a room three times the size of the one in which he awoke. In the center sat a wooden table with three chairs. One wall held several shelves containing plates and other cooking equipment. Set against another section of the wall was a simple wooden desk atop which papers lay in haphazard fashion. An inkwell sat near the stack of papers with a quill lying beside it. The bow that saved his life hung over the desk along with a quiver of arrows. On the side of the bow opposite the quiver was a sword and shield, both of which had the look of having been well used. <clears throat> Attention drawn to the opening of the door, Saren spied him and gave a nod as the warden continued slicing vegetables. He indicated the table with a jerk of his head. Have a seat. This will need to cook a little longer. Hobbling to the table, James looked longingly toward the stew pot simmering upon a hook over a gently burning fire in the fireplace. The mouth-watering aroma caused his stomach to growl. Taking a seat facing Saren, he said, I haven't had a good meal for a while. Saren grinned and chuckled. Whether this will be good or not, you'll have to decide. Finishing with the preparations, he dropped the sliced vegetables into the stew pot. Then moving to the counter, he filled two mugs from a pitcher and brought them to the table. James took one, <coughs> looked within, and sniffed uncertainly. It's just ale, lad. You look like you could use some. Giving him a wink, Saren tossed back his mug and took a deep draught. Bringing the mug to his mouth, James hesitantly took a sip. When the liquid hit his tongue, he had to admit it wasn't bad. A little strong for his taste, but not worse than some of the stuff he had tried at Dave's. <clears throat> Glancing to Saren, James noticed that he was being scrutinized. I suppose you have a lot of questions. Yes, a couple. But your business is just that, your business. You seem a nice enough lad. You needn't feel obligated to tell me anything more than what you want. Saren set his mug on the table and then returned to the stew pot where he stirred it with a large wooden spoon. Can't let it burn. That's what my grandmother always said too. Remember time sitting at his grandmother's kitchen while she cooked and made him a little homesick. She must have been a nice woman. A good cook maybe? He cast a look to James and received a nod in reply. Returning his attention to the pot, he stirred the stew a few more times. Once satisfied that it wasn't in, in any immediate danger of burning, he set the spoon on the counter and returned to the table. Grabbing his mug, he downed the rest of it. She was the best. Sometimes there would be little in the house, and she could whip up the most wonderful dinners. Memories of fine meals made his stomach growl loudly indeed. It'll be just a few minutes longer. Where am I exactly? A surprised look came over Saren. You mean you don't know where you are? Not really. After taking another sip of the not entirely unpleasant ale, he added, I've been lost. The forest ward studied his face a moment before answering. You are near the Kelawan River, not far from the township of Trendle. The forest I found you in is called the Dark Forest of Kelawan. Nothing really dark about it unless you come here ill-prepared. It's my job to help people in trouble, like yourself, and if need be, get a crew to clear the roads where a tree falls and blocks the trails. I am very glad you were there for me. Those wolves were after me ever since the night before. I took out one that had wandered into my camp and the other seemed to have it in for me ever since. Pausing for another sip of ale, he then asked, how far is it to Trindle? About a day and a half's walk. In your condition, you'll never make it. You'll need to rest at least until tomorrow. I'm heading there in the morning and could take you if you like. I'd appreciate that, thank you. 
James's was warming to Saren, a rather genial chap. His easy speech and relaxed demeanor put James at ease. Saren went to inspect the stew again, using the spoon to take a taste. He nodded approvingly and removed the pot from the fire. After setting it on the table, he crossed to the shelves and selected two bowls and a pair of smaller wood spoons. Returning to the table, he handed one to each of James. Or, one of each to James. Following Saren's lead, James dipped his spoon into the stew pot and proceeded to fill his bowl. The stew had a thick gravy and contained many different vegetables, some familiar with a little bit of meat. While he filled his bowl, Saren fetched a loaf of bread. Using his belt knife, the warden removed off two thick slices and handed one to James. Breaking off a corner, James dipped the bread into the stew's gravy. With the gravy covered bread, when the gravy covered bread hit his taste buds, his salivary glands went into overdrive. This tasted great. He took up his spoon and eagerly scooped up as much meat and veggies as the utensil could hold. Oh man, he mumbled as he as he appreciated he mumbled appreciatively as he chewed. The meat was flavorful without being tough, and the veggies were soft yet still firm. Eating with gusto, James soon emptied his bowl and was scooping a second helping out of the pot. Hungry? James realized that he was st starting his second bowl while Saren still had yet to finish his first. Slightly embarrassed at being a glutton, he replied, Either I am completely starving, or this is the best stew I've ever had. <laughs> Saren chuckled. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Eat as much as you can hold. You look like you could use it. Scooping out another helping, the forest warden refilled his bowl and then cut out a section of bread for himself and James. Once the meal was over and hunger had been satisfied, Saren took the bowls and spoons outside to the river and washed them. Once finished, he set them on the shelf. He then placed a lid on the stew pot before moving it onto a side table. Night had fallen by this time. The only light was that from the fire. Saren settled into a chair and pulled out his pipe and filled it from a pouch. He set a smoldering stick to the fire from the fire to it and puffed several times. He leaned back in his chair as pipe smoke began to encircle his head. James brought a chair and sat next to the warden. The warmth coming from the flames felt good and, quick, and quickly relaxed him. He watched, he watched the flames dance as they consumed the wood and thought how his life had changed over the past few days. From home to the woods and now a friendly warden's home, he couldn't help but wonder what the next day would hold. Through the thoughts of the past two days, and what may lie ahead occupying his mind, he had a hard time keeping his eyes open. Repeatedly, his head drooped to his chest, only to certainly suddenly jerk back up. Noticing his problem, Saren offered him the bed he awoke in earlier, and offered James was not about to refuse. After thanking his host, he used his spear again as a crutch and made his way to the back room. Climbing into bed, he thought to himself, lucky to have found Saren. Not many would have taken stranger into their home and fed them. I owe him a lot. A few lingering thoughts about what the next day might hold were all that he managed before sleep took him. Thud. The bedroom door crashing open startled James out of a deep sleep. Sitting bolt upright, he turned blurry eyes toward the doorway. Three sword-wielding men were wearing worn, mismatched pieces of armor and t entered and did a quick look around. Upon seeing him, one of them hollered out the door, There's another one here. A lad hiding in his bed. Saren lied. From outside came the reply, Bring him out. We'll take care of both of them. One of the men headed toward the bed. The man took him roughly by the arm and hauled him to his feet. Pain from his wound shot up his leg as his foot hit the floor. Crying out, he was given little sympathy as he was propelled through the door with a shove. James stumbled into the front room, his injured leg protesting with every, with every pain-filled step. Another rough shove from behind pushed him toward the door leaning outside. Despite the throbbing of his leg, he somehow made it through without falling. Not far from the front door of the cabin were two more men with sword, drawn swords standing next to a bound body on the ground. As James was pushed forward, he discovered the captain to be Saren. He was relieved to see the forest warden turn his head and glance silently at him. At least Saren was still conscious and alert. One of the men who had taken him from the cabin pulled his arms behind his back and bound them tightly, uh, bound them together painfully tight. Once his hands were secured, he was shoved to the ground next to Saren. Don't move and keep your mouth shut, one of the four sword-wielding men commanded. James glanced at the man and nodded. Seeing that James planned to cooperate, the guard grunted and then turned to his partner. With their captain's attention for the moment focused elsewhere, he scooted closer to Saren until they were less than a foot apart. Who are they? Outlaws. They're mad because I brought one of them 
and it was executed. He killed two women who were traveling through here a while back. What are they going to do with this? They'll probably torture and kill me. You? Saren paused as one of the guards glanced in their direction. When the guard again focused his attention elsewhere, he continued, You, they may kill, or they may take you south and sell you to the slavers. I'm sorry, lad. And an outlaw, a little larger than the rest, and bearing a tattoo of a snake on his left forearm, stormed over to Saren and kicked him in the side. I told you to be quiet. In the other word, and I'll cut out your tongue. To emphasize his point, he kicked Saren hard in the side twice more before walking off. Two outlaws continued to stand guard over them with their swords drawn and ready. James leaned close to Saren and in a barely audible whisper asked, Are you okay? A slight nod of Saren's head was his only answer. I'm going to try and loosen your bonds. Saren met his gaze and shook his head. Too risky. Just be ready. Their gazes met and there must have been something in James's eye for Saren nodded. Concentrating on envisioning their bonds coming apart, James whis whispered, Ropes that bind me and you come apart in pieces, too. James felt a slackening in the rope binding his arms together as the fibers parted. Saren gave him a look full of surprise as his wrists were once again free. Whispering so only Saren could hear, he said, Now for the outlaws. Be ready. The warren paused only a moment before nodding. He understood. Looking around, he searched for... Looking around, James searched for something that could be used to hurt, maybe even kill the outlaws. His gaze came to rest on the fire, and an idea took shape. Speaking fiery, he cast his, he cast his spell. Fire that's hot. Hey, the boss said no talking. Ignore him, James continued. Fire that's bright. The guard took a step toward him. I said to shut up, or I'll shut you up. Send balls of flame. Okay, you asked for it. Taking two more steps, the guard reached his side and prepared to kick him in the head. Before the guard could complete the maneuver, James looked him in the eye and shouted, To burn outlaws this night. At the final utterance of the spell, magic streamed from him as the fire erupted in an explosion of shooting fireballs. The outlaws had only a moment to realize their danger. One such fiery projector nearly singed James's hair as it slammed into the man standing before him. The resultant explosion knocked the outlaw back and showered James and Sarah with sparks. Similar bursts flared throughout the area. The, the spell used far too much of his unreplenished reserves, draining what strength he had and caused him to lose consciousness. Saren saw James pass out, but couldn't take the time to determine if he was okay. Screams of pain and confusion filled the night. Rolling to the side, Saren kicked out with his foot and brought a guard whose clothes were afire to the ground. He definitely avoided the flames as he took possession of the guard's sword. Upending it, he plunged it through the man's chest, pinning him to the ground. Quickly getting to the feast, to his feet, he placed a foot upon the dead outlaw's chest and pulled the sword free. A nearby guard cried out as his hair ignited and went up in flames. Moving toward him, Saren struck out with his sword and an outlaw's head went flying. The head hit the ground and rolled like a flaming ball until it came to a sizzling stop. Another outlaw lay smoldering on the ground. Still another raced through the forest, a pillar of flame in the darkness. The man's screams echoed through the night. Scanning the area for any others who may have escaped James's flaming attack, Saren found no sign of the leader. Counting those taken out by the fire fireballs, he realized two of the leader's henchmen also remained unaccounted. Returning to James, he found him still breathing, but was unable to rouse him. Using one hand, he grabbed his shirt and dragged him toward the cabin. With his other, he retained the bloody sword which had taken out two of the outlaws. He didn't get far before the man with the tattoo appeared from the direction of the river. <coughs> Behind him walked the remaining two outlaws, only one seeming to have emerged from the attack unscathed. Saren, the tattooed man shouted, I'm going to get you and let the animals eat your entrails while you're still happy, alive to enjoy it. Then I'll cut out the heart of that demon damn mage. Covered in burns, clothing charred nearly beyond recognition, he made a frightening sight. The tattooed man came for Saren while the other two moved to flank him. Knowing they would follow him and ignore James as long as he was unconscious, Saren left him on the ground and approached the outlaws with swords ready. Three to one would be bad odds in a normal situation, but after what James had done to them, the outlaws would be slowed by the pain. Saren fainted at one on the right. Out of the, out of the, corner, of, out of the, out of the corner of his eye, he saw the one on his left coming into his exposed flank. When the one on his left sliced towards Saren's head, Saren dropped to the ground and rolled toward him, striking a serious blow on the, on the, to the outlaw's thigh, opening an artery. The warden leaped back to his feet as the outlaw gave out with a cry and dropped to the ground. The leader came in with a swift thrust aimed at Saren's chest, which he deftly blocked. He was forced to jump back when Saren counterattacked with a slice of the leader's leg. 
una unable to avoid the at his attacker, Saren's sword opened up a shell cut on the tattooed leader's upper thigh. Seeing an opening created by Saren's attack, the remaining henchmen leaped in and thrust. S Saren twisted just in time and managed to receive only a small cut along his shoulder. Ignoring the pain, he fainted at the leader and then came back with a black, with a backhanded slice which caused the henchman to stumble backward and trip over the outlaw writhing on the ground, doing his best to keep his life's blood from leaving his body. Seeing his chance, Saren pressed the leader who was becoming weakened from the loss of blood and trauma of having been burned. Slash, block, block, slash. He needed to finish the leader before the remaining henchman regained his feet and rejoined the battle. Saren sliced the leader's head at the arm, the head back and forth. The leader successfully blocked each of Saren's maneuvers. Saren, you cannot win. I am the better swordsman. Undaunted by taunts, Saren uh, doubled down his efforts. Having regained his feet, the henchman moved to join the battle. Saren saw him approaching and with a burst of speed and skill, continued his attacks upon the leader. The henchman pressed Saren hard, which gave the leader time to drop out of the battle to catch his breath. The henchman hammered away, hack, hack, slash. His attacks had very little skill, trying to bull his way through Saren's defense with not but brute, with brute strength. Using skill acquired through dozens of conflicts, Saren successfully blo blocked each of the attacks and began to understand the rhythm of the henchman's attacks. Hack, hack, slash. Hack, hack, slash. Timing it just right, he blocked the next two hacks, and when the henchman came in with a slash, Saren dropped un under the incoming blade and thrust with his own sword, taking the outlaw upward through the chest. Saren kicked out with his foot to dislodge the outlaw from his blade and turned to find the leader coming straight for him, a wild look in his eyes. With a primal scream, the leader charged. Wielding his sword in both hands, he brought it down with all his strength, attempting to hew Saren in half. Striking the leader's sword, Saren succeeded in deflecting it away, throwing the leader off balance. Saren kicked out with his foot and connected with the leader's knee. With satisfaction, he heard the bones snap. Off balance and with his knee broken, the leader cried out in pain. He twisted and, and dropped face first to the ground. Moving to finish it, Slayer sliced through the leader's back and severed the spine. Paralyzed, the leader stared with hate-filled eyes at Saren as the blood flowed out of him, first bringing unconsciousness, then death. Panting, Saren wiped the sweat from his brow as he surveyed the battlefield and found only smoldering dead outlaws. He tossed the sword down and returned to James. He lifted him off the ground and carried him into the cabin where before he laid him upon the bed. Waking the next morning, James found a blood-soaked Saren next to him. Checking to make sure the forest warden was still alive, he discovered that most of the blood staining Saren's clothes was not the warden's. Even though he had a head that felt like it was being used as an anvil, James managed to rise and investigate the situation outside. The area in front of the cabin was a scene of carnage. Bodies lit in the ground <clears throat> and blood was everywhere. His respect for the swordsman his respect for the swordsmanship of Saren was high. He moved from one outlaw to the next, not finding any that still lived. He returned to the cabin and built a fire to ward off the morning chill. Not with magic, for after last night he could not even think of magic without his head hurting. The spell with the fire had been far too draining. In fact, it had almost killed him. He was determined to refrain from using magic for the time being, at least until he regained some of his strength. He finally got a good fire going. He hung the remnants of last night's pot of stew over the flames. Taking an empty jug, he hobbled with the aid of a spear to the river and filled it with water. Once back in the cabin, he filled a bowl and located a somewhat clean cloth. He brought them into the bedroom and began cleaning up the blood off Saren. Not long after beginning, Saren awakened. He unexpectedly, his unexpected grabbing of James's hand startled him and nearly caused James to spill the contents of the bowl. I can take care of myself. I'm not that weak. Smiling, James replied, I'm just returning the favor. You saved our lives out there last night. I think we both deserve credit for still being alive. Sitting up, he swung his legs over the edge of the bed. You have so many surprises about you, yes? Coming to his feet, he headed for the door. I suppose I do. James grabbed his spear as he accompanied Saren to the river. His leg still hurt badly, but with the aid of the spear, was able to make it without it worsening. Changing the subject, James asked, Who were those guys last night? Saren knelt at the water's edge and, and commenced to wash the blood that stained his hands and arms. Sometimes he was... For, something he was far too tired to do the night before. The leader's name is, or was, Garrett. Some called him Garrett the Snake after the tattoo of the green serpent on his arm. His little band of cutthroats have been raiding this area for a couple of years. No one has ever been able to stop him until now. There's a reward for taking him down. I have no use for it, and since you saved us last night, you can claim it. 
now I've gotten I've gotten a lot of heat over over that um, over over the reward for for Garrett the Snake and, and, and his cronies, and that Sarah didn't take it. Well, Sarah didn't take it because without James, he he would have been dead. So he saw he saw James James um, he felt indebted to James for his life. So he offered him, you know, the the reward. Now the amount of the reward, I've I've gotten a lot of flack about that too. Um, I. When I wrote this, I had no idea what a good reward was. I just threw some numbers out there. Sounded good. So, yeah. And James needed money to start out with, too, so this worked out. Uh, thanks, but I wouldn't feel right about taking all of it. Turning his head, he glanced up at James. Take it. If you don't, it'll just be used to fatten some administrator's purse. I'm sure you could use it. After removing all traces of blood from his exposed skin, he got back to his feet and returned to the cabin. Once inside, Saren inspected the cook pot and used his big spoon to stir it. A sniff and taste later, he pronounced it ready. M removing it from the fire, he carried it to the table. James lent a hand by taking the bowls and spoons from the shelf, plus a couple of mugs, and set them on the table. While he served the soup, Saren poured the ale and they set to eating. After Saren finished his first bowl, he looked at James and asked, So you're a mage, eh? In a manner of speaking, I'm sort of new at it. New or not, that was some spell you cast with the f balls of fire. Quick thinking. You would be good to have on one side in a fight. Reddening slightly under the praise, James shook his head. Not too good if I pass out before it's all over. He still felt the shame of his weakness of the night before. He felt like he let Sarah down when he, when he needed him most. Now, don't you belittle what you did. Your actions turned the tide in our favor, and without your efforts, this morning would have found us dead or wishing we were. Saren let James take a second helping and then scooped out the rest for himself. James thought about what Saren had said and came to admit that there might be some merit to it. Feeling slightly better, he downed the rest of his L and let out, and let out a large belch. Saren chuckled. After we finish here, I'll hitch my horse to the wagon and take you to, into Trindle. It wasn't long before their bowls were empty. Saren glanced at James and said, Just rest here while I get the wagon ready. I'll bring it round front. We need to bring in the bodies if you're to receive the reward. Heading out the door, he made his way to the corral behind the house. In a few minutes, he had his horse hitched to the wagon and brought it around to the front. With a strength belying his wounds, one by one, he gathered the bodies of the outlaws and placed them in the wagon. After the last outlaw was in, he used a tarp to cover the grisly scene and returned back inside to inform James it was time to leave. James hobbled to the bedroom where he gathered his few belongings and carried them out to the wagon where Saren waited for him. Tossing his backpack to the ward, he asked, you didn't happen to see a book lying on the ground when you rescued me from the wolves. Catching the backpack, Sam Sugar says, No, but I wasn't looking for one either. I was more interested in saving your life. Why? Was it important? Yeah, it was. Too bad. I doubt if we could find it now. If you lost it during the fight last during the last fight with the wolves, then it's in the river and no telling where it would be now. With a helping hand from Saren, James managed to climb onto the wagon and took his seat next to the warden. I guess you're right. You feel bad about losing the book, but, but realize there was little that might be done about it now. No sense bemoaning what can't be changed. With a flick of the reins, Saren got the horse moving. They pulled out onto the dirt lane that led from his cabin. After a short ways, it met, it met the main road, which ran along the Kelowan River on its way to Trindle. Not far from where they turned onto the road, they found where the outlaws had picketed their horses. Pausing for only a short time, Saren gathered the horses and tied them in a line behind the wagon. Once secured, he returned to his seat and got the wagon moving. For a time, they remained quiet as James took in the beauty of the area. To his right was the rolling Kelowan River, well over 50 feet across and flowing smoothly. The sun filtered through the trees and banished the morning chill. It made way for a warm summer day. The birds flittered to and fro and called out in a multitudinous chorus. How far is Trindle? About a day's ride. We should be there by nightfall. Glancing at James, he added, I probably should warn you that majors are not well thought of in these parts. Some bad things happened a while ago, and, well, that's to say that the people haven't forgotten. They don't much trust strangers at all, really. It takes them a while to warm up to anyone. They're good people, just wary. I can understand that. I'll try not to give them a reason to distrust me. There's a family who has a farm just outside of town. If you like, I could take you there and see if they will let you stay with them while you are recuperating. Yeah, I like that. I'm a pretty quiet person who tries not to be a bother to anyone. Sarah nodded and chuckled. I've noticed that about you. 
After we deliver the bodies to the town hall and talk to the mayor, we'll head out there. Nodding, he agreed to the plan. How much of a reward is there for Garrett and his man? I believe 500 gold pieces for Garrett and another 100 for each of his henchmen, he replied after giving it, it a moment's thought. If I'm remembering that right, you should get 1,100 gold pieces, a tidy sum. You can always have your pick of the horses too if you like. The rest will go to the town where they'll be auctioned off at the end of the month. 1,100 gold pieces and a horse. James couldn't believe his good fortune. My situation is getting better and better. Okay, um, let's just pause for a moment. One of the things that that um, people complain about is um, everything's so easy for James. I mean, he gets he gets there, he, he gets money real fast, he gets a horse real fast, and boom, he's set. Well, the way I was thinking of it, somebody wants him for a job. Now, if you want a person to be a carpenter, you're probably going to supply him tools. You're probably going to, you know, tool belt, um, wood, 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 wood to carpent with. Now, so James, the persons who want him for a job are going to arrange certain things so he can complete his job. And one of the things he's going to need is money. And the other thing is going to be a horse, at least, at least in the beginning. So this is sort of set up by his employer, so to speak, to get him go to, to get him started well. And then what he does with it after that's up to him. But you know things are things are are put in his path to help him along his way by his employers. Does that make sense? Okay. So hopefully I won't hear any more about that <laughs> that, that problem. Okay. I don't know too much about horses. Sarah and I didn't want to surprise. Truly? James nodded. Well, then don't worry. I'll pick one for you. One that's not too temperamental. Thanks. I would appreciate that. For the rest of the trip, they rode in silence. James dozed on and off, still not completely over the previous day's exertions and last night's magical feat. Later that evening, when the sun had sunken low in the sky, Saren directed his attention to the road ahead. Nestled in among the trees along the sides of the river were several wooden buildings. Several nodded when he looked questioningly at him. Trindle. So so James is now in Trindle. So the first part of what he needed to do was was accomplished. Now, if you need a lot of I've gotten some comments uh from people about about him being just plopped there in the, in the forest. No. No 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 direction or no nothing. Well, he did have direction. You know, the creature was there and told him a few things. He had the book, which helped him get him thinking about magic. Now, the book. I've had a lot of questions about the book. Okay, the book was meant to get his mind focused on a certain, on, on magic, on, on doing magic. So, but he, it, it didn't want to ingrain that, what it was saying in him. Because the more, because if he kept reading it, then it, then it doing it by rhyme and, by by rhyme and meter would have been ingrained, and once it's ingrained, he he couldn't have done it, he couldn't have performed magic any other way. So the book was just to get him started with magic. Then at, then once he got magic, the book was removed. So that's where the book went, and that's why it was there in the first place. You know, touching the book. At the interview, he got a shock. That shock opened the portal, or, or or activated the portal, and he could walk through. Then he then he read the read the he read the principles of magic, and since he was a role player, dungeon master, really into fantasy books, he was more inclined to believe that yeah, maybe this could happen. And walking through the door helped reinforce the belief that he could do magic. And in this world, to do magic, you have to believe you can do magic. And if, and if there's any doubt, you can't do it, period. Then once you believe you can do magic, you can do magic, and then you can refine it from there. So that's, that's where all this is coming from. Now, <coughs> when you, when, often when, when um, a company hires somebody, you know, the, the, for first there's training, then there's, um, you watch them work to, to see if they can do the job. Well, they needed someone to do a certain thing. 
and they needed someone with a certain skill set or a certain ability, let's say. So, but at this point, James has, 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 has clicked off two things. He has clicked off his ability to, to do magic and he has a, and, but he was able to survive to reach Trindle. You know, if you need someone to do something and they can't survive, they can't do magic, they're, they're no good to you. So, so he's clicked off two of, of, of the, of, of the um, new hire checklist, if you might say. And now at Trindle, we'll see what happens. So tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll read um, chapter four. But that's, what, that, that's where we're at now. James is still in the, um, well, let's see if, if, if um, he's going to make it. That's why all, the, all these people went through the door. See, Seth, you know, found, found the book went through the door. Obviously, another book was, was put there for, for the next applicant. But either he couldn't figure out how to do magic or he couldn't figure out how to survive, but he died. And so, so, so he wasn't able to... He failed at um, the new hire um, requirements. So that's where we stand. I'll see you tomorrow.